Hello, I'm Robert Lomas, and this is a seventh of 17 episodes of a work called Ten Nights in the Black Lion, which was written by the novelist Daniel Owen in 1859. It was originally written as a serial in a magazine called Charles O'Bala, which was produced by his friend Nathaniel Jones. This is the seventh episode, and it was published on June the 18th, 1859. Episode 7 the fourth evening. It was shortly after dark when I heard Mr. Slade speaking to his wife. Where are you going, Anne? asked the innkeeper. I'm going to look for Mr. Morgan, replied his wife. What for? Because I want to, she replied. Well, I don't want you to, said Slade, sounding determined. I can't help that, Simon. Mary is almost dead and Joe is in a terrible state. I must go there, and you should go there too, for it's because of you that Morgan and his family are distressed. You might think on that. Yes, I will, said the innkeeper, appalled. I shouldn't preach to you in this way. Oh, well then, don't interfere with me, Simon. My mind is made up. I'll go as I have told you I would, and I will. Mrs Slade turned to leave, and Simon stared after her, writhing with indecision. Mrs Slade quickly walked the few hasty steps, to the pitiful home of the poor drunkard. His wife met her at the door. How is Mary? was her first serious question. Mrs. Morgan tried to answer her, but although her lips moved, she made no sound. Mrs. Slade squeezed her hand affectionately and let her lead her to the room where the child lay. One look at Mary's pale cheeks was enough to persuade Mrs. Slade that death was already placing his cold fingers on the child's constitution. How are you, sweetheart? she asked, as she leaned over to kiss the child. Better, thank you, Mary whispered. Then she fixed her eyes on her mother's looking askance. What's up, sweetheart? Has Daddy woken up yet? No, dear heart. Will he wake up soon? He's sleeping pretty heavily. I'm not going to wake him up just yet. Oh, no, don't wake him. I thought he was already awake. Then Mary closed her eyelids and was silent in an instant. While she slept, Mrs. Morgan told Mrs. Slade in a low voice, Oh, we had a rough ride with poor Joe last night. I had to get the doctor to him and leave him alone. And while I was out, he'd come to see Mary, and she had her arms around his neck, trying to comfort him. He slept that way for a long time. The doctor came while he was still asleep, and left him something to take, and then went away. I was hoping Joe would stay asleep, but about halfway through the night he woke up and jumped out of bed in great terror. He was shouting in horror. He awoke poor Mary, and she was greatly alarmed. She's got much worse since then, Mrs. Slade. Joe had rushed towards the door, and she grabbed his arm and tried to hold him back with all her might. Mary was shouting at him, trying to get him to come back. We had a lot of trouble getting him back to bed. I gave him the medicine that Dr. Green had left, and he took it easily. But we had great trouble with him all night. He got up six times from his bed, and every time Mary persuaded him to go back. I kept giving him the morphine as the doctor ordered, and by the morning it had affected him so much that he fell into a heavy sleep, and he stayed asleep ever since. I'm worried in case he never wakes up. I've heard of such a thing as the aftermath of the drink. Look, Daddy has woken up, said Mary, lifting her head from the pillow. She hadn't heard the conversation between her mother and Mrs. Slade, because they had been talking very low. Mrs. Morgan went to the door and looked into the room where her husband lay. He's still sleeping, sweetheart, she said, returning to Mary's bedside. Oh, I want him to wake up. I'll go and see him. Why don't you call him, Mummy? I've called him many times, but the doctor has given him something to make him sleep. He can't wake up yet. He's been asleep a very long time, don't you think so, Mother? Yes, Mary, but it's for the best. He'll be better by the time you wake up. Mary closed her eyes a second time. How pale her cheeks were, how deep her eyes had sunk. There was such a change in her entire face. I've given her up, Mrs. Slade, whispered Mrs. Morgan, overwhelmed by her feelings. I've given her up. The worst is over. But oh, my heart breaks. My dear child, in all her misery, she has kept comforting and helping me. Father, father, shouted Mary excitedly. Mrs. Morgan went over to the bed and put her hand on her daughter's. He's still sleeping heavily, sweetheart, she said. 
He isn't, mother. I heard him move. Go and see if he's woken up. To satisfy her, her mother left the room, and to her surprise saw her husband sitting up with his eyes wide open. What does Mary want? he asked. She wants to see you. She's called out for you many times. Shall I bring her here? No, I'll get dressed and go to her. Perhaps you'd better not. You've been very ill. Oh no, I'm all right. I don't feel sick now. Morgan dressed himself and with his wife's help dragged his tense body to the room where Mary lay. Oh, father, she said, with such a cheerfulness coming over her face. I've been awake and waiting for you for so long. I thought you'd never wake up. Kiss me, daddy. What can I do for you? asked Morgan as he placed his face on the pillow by her side. Nothing, father. I want for nothing. I only wanted to see you. Oh, my dear father, you've always been so good to me, said the child, gently placing her small hand on his face. Oh, no, I've never been good for anyone, said Morgan, his voice breaking as he rose from the pillow. Oh, how the child's words tugged at Mrs. Slade as she sat silently witnessing this scene. You've not been good to yourself, father, but you've always been good to us. Don't, Mary, don't say that, said Morgan. Tell me I've been bad, very bad. Oh, dear Mary, if I were as good as you, I'd be dying and leaving this old evil world. Oh, if there were no liquor here, no pubs, no bar rooms. Oh, dear, I wouldn't have done thus. The wretched man hid his face in the bedclothes and wept bitterly. An overwhelming silence reigned over the room for a long time. Mary broke that silence. Father, she said, her voice pure and clear. Father, I want to tell you something. What is it, Mary? Nobody will come to get you home, Father. Her lips trembled and tears filled her eyes. Don't talk about that, Mary. I'm not going to go out until you are well. Don't you remember? I promised. But Father, Mary's voice was hesitant. What, sweetheart? I'm going to leave Mummy and you. Oh, no, Mary, don't do that. We can't give you up, sweetheart, said Morgan, his voice almost melting into tears. But God has called me. Mary said these words very seriously, and her eyes turned heavenwards, filled with admiration. Oh, that the Lord would have called me instead. What's happening to you? Oh, dear. Morgan groaned, hiding his face between his hands. Oh, how I wish he had called me. Father, Mary spoke quietly again. You're not ready yet. God will let you live longer to make yourself better. How can I make myself better without you helping me, Mary? I've tried to help you, Daddy. Yes, many times, said Mary. Yes, yes, you were always trying to help me. But it was no use. You kept going out, and you kept going to the pub, as if you couldn't stop. Mr Morgan's heart was too full for him to speak. He sat, tears running like rivers from his eyes, staring at his child's face. Father, I dreamed something about you while I fell asleep today. What was that, Mary? I thought it was night, and that I was still ill. You'd promised you wouldn't go out until I was well, but you'd gone out anyway, and I thought you'd gone to see Mr Slade. Knowing this, I felt myself as strong as when I was healthy, and so I got up, got dressed, and chased after you. But before I'd gone very far, I met Mr. Slade's big dog, Nero, and I was terribly frightened. I trembled, and I tried to run back home. But as I went round Mr. Mason's house, there was Nero in the road, and he jumped at my clothes and tore them. I ran back, and he ran after me all the way home. But when I got to the door, I looked around, and I saw Mr. Slade urging Nero on after me. I saw Mr. Slade staring straight at me. Then I wasn't afraid any more. I walked past Nero who growled at me and showed his teeth. But he didn't attack me. Mr. Slade tried to stop me, but I ran past him until I came to the pub. There you were, standing at the door. You had a new hat and coat and new boots polished like Mr. Hammond's. And I said, Father, is that you? Yes, Mary, you said, sweeping me up in your arms. Not the old Joe Morgan, but Mr. Morgan now. It was all so weird. You were happy standing in the bar room which was full of goods for sale. The sign of the black line had been taken down, and over the door I could read your name, Father. Mr. Joe Morgan, General Merchant. I was so glad when I woke up. 
But after all, it was only a dream. The child spoke the last words intensely and slowly. An interval of deep silence followed. The anxious listeners didn't say what was in their hearts. Their feelings were too intense for words. Nearly five minutes passed, and then Mary whispered her father's name, but didn't open her eyes. Morgan answered, and lowered his ear to hear her weak voice. "'When I am gone to heaven, there will be no one with you except my mother,' said Mary. "'None but my mother, and she always cries when you are away.' "'I wouldn't leave her, Mary, except when I'm at work,' said Morgan, "'and I'll never go out at night again.' You promise that? I'll promise you more. What, father? I'll never go to the pub again. Never? I never will, and I'll promise you even more. Father? I will never drink a drop of liquor while I'm out. Oh, dear, dear father. With a burst of joy, she threw herself on his bosom. Morgan hugged her warmly and sat with his lips sealed on her cheek and as she lay in his arms, the stillness of death came over her. Yes, death. For when Morgan relaxed his arms, his child's spirit was singing in the midst of the angels. That's the end of the seventh episode of Ten Nights in the Black Lion, written by Daniel Owen. It was first published in the magazine Charles Abala on June the 18th, 1859. I'm Robert Lomas and I spent the last year translating this. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please click the subscribe box in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen.